Okay, so we've talked about the cell membrane, the outer membrane that goes around the cell, right? Now we're going to go ahead and shift over and talk about the stuff inside the cell. So we're going to talk about the cytoplasm first, and we're going to split it into the non-membranous organelles and the membranous organelles. So let's go first and talk, kind of review what we, we should know by now. When we look at the cell components, we have the plasma membrane, which is the outer membrane that holds the intracellular fluid, the stuff inside, inside the cell, and separates from the extracellular fluid. All this stuff inside the cell is referred to as the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm, all this goo in here, is basically a liquidy substance that has a lot of particles and organelles inside of it. Right. So the cytoplasm, again, you have cytosol, which is the watery substance that has some sugar particles, some fat particles, some amino acids floating in. And it's kind of jelly-like. It's almost like um, jello, where you have jello that has proteins in it, um, the gelatinous material, and it also has sugars in it. It's the same kind of idea. It's just not as thick as a jiggler. It's just more watery. But that's what's inside of a cell. Other things that are in here are going to be the organelles. Here's an organelle. This is a mitochondria we'll talk about. Here's some Golgi apparatus. You can see that these have this shiny, glossy membrane around them. They're like sacs that are inside the, the uh, cell. Then you have these structures that hold thing in, things in place. Like these are tubules. It's almost like a skeleton. This is like a pipe and you have a rope, an intermediate filament, and a microfilament um, that are like little strings that are holding things in place. We're going to go through and talk about each of those one at a time. But I really want to make sure you understand the difference between a membrane-bound and a non-membrane-bound organelle. The membrane itself is the same substance as the plasma membrane. So imagine this is the outside of the cell. Here you have your phospholipid bilayer, right? Here's an organelle on the inside that's made of the same substance as the outside of the cell. So the outer part of the cell, all the way around here on the outside of the cell here, we have the plasma membrane that's full of phospholipids, proteins, and, and well, carbohydrates on the surface. In this situation, you typically just have the phospholipids. It's a bilayer. So some of these organelles that we're going to talk about through here, these are all enclosed in this, this lipid bilayer. The non-membrane bound organelles don't have a wrapper around at the side of them. They're freestanding or free floating type of substances and we're going to go through and talk about each of these. Right, first the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton when you look here's the outside part of the membrane. Here's an organelle, there's an organelle and all the structure that's holding things in place is the skeleton. It's just like your skeleton. So your rib cage helps hold your lungs in place, supports your lungs, protect your lungs. It's the same idea in a cell. The cytoskeleton is made of a protein scaffolding and what it does is it gives support to the cell, it gives structure to the cell. It helps hold things in place like a scaffolding. It also helps transport materials back and forth. So it'll help carry materials up and down. We'll talk about later how this is like a railroad. We'll put a material here and we can actually shuffle it or shuttle it across that long tubule. You can see in this picture it suspends or other organelles. Like these membrane bound organelles, look how they're secured in place so that this mitochondria is not just floating around, it's actually secured in its location. If I need to move it to another area of the cell, I can. I'll just use this railroad and transport it. And then also for adhesions. So you can see how this cytoskeleton comes all the way up into the outer membrane, the plasma membrane. You can use this to tie it down or secure it to other organ or to other cells. These last ones are kind of interesting, so contraction and movement. We're going to talk about a couple special types of cytoskeleton. We'll talk about something called a microfilament. We'll also talk about something called an intermediate filament. Those, in a muscle cell, you have a large abundance of those two types of skeleton. The cool thing about them is that they move across each other. They contract. So when a muscle contracts, it actually pulls these pieces of cytoskeleton together for contraction. I'll show you how that works, and we'll get into more detail even when we get into the muscle section. And then movement, the cytoskeleton is not permanent. It rearranges. So it may not look like this you know, a second from now. What's kind of cool is that these cells, if they want to move around in space, like for instance a white blood cell, which is part of your immune system that chases bacteria, part of the ways that it chases bacteria is it rearranges its cytoskeleton. It'll take these tubules and rearrange them and push them outward. I'm not saying outward like poke through the membrane. It pushes them outward and the membrane will wrap up around it. So it's almost like you reaching an arm out, grabbing a hold of something, and then pulling at something towards you. Or reaching an arm out, grabbing something, and pulling your whole body towards whatever that something is. So there are ways that the cell moves by rearranging its cytoskeleton. It's kind of cool. It's not like us where our skeleton is one shape and it's like that the whole life. The cells can typically rearrange 
for whatever function they need to, to be able to sustain. Right? Again, here are the three main types of fibers or protein um, units that we're going to talk about with the side of skeleton. It's not made out of calcium like ours. It's made out of proteins. Right? So microtubules are going to be long cylindrical ones. So here are the three types. Which one, of course, is it talking about? Well, it's going to talk about this one. See how it's a cylinder? It actually looks like a steel pipe, if you ask me. It's very rigid and firm, like a steel pipe. I mean, if you have a 20-foot steel pipe and you wiggle it a little bit, it'll wobble back and forth, but it's very strong, very secure. Next are the microfilaments. They're the smallest ones, these little teeny tiny ones. Look, they're just like two chains of pearls twisted around each other. They're very, very weak. They're very small. If you give them too much pull, you can actually break them. And the third one's the intermediate. And intermediate is telling you it's in between the others. So it's not thick and, and round like a piece of steel pipe, but at the same time, it's not weak like a little piece of thread. It actually is made up of long chains. They're twisted, almost like a rope. So a rope's really strong. I mean, you could pull a car with a rope. You couldn't pull a car with a chain of beads, right? You could push a car with a steel pipe. So the thickness of these tells you kind of their functions. This is extremely flexible, but very weak. This is extremely strong, but not very flexible. This is right in between. It's strong and it's flexible. So they all have benefits. And when you look at the organelles inside of here, like this is the mitochondria, you can see you have these tubes coming off of it, which are microtubules. You can see they have these little tiny strings, which are the microfilaments. And then you have these pink fibers, the intermediate filaments, they're kind of in between. And we'll show you how these are arranged. They look like they're just hit and miss flopping all over the place, but they're not. They're actually really well organized to hold things like the endoplasmic reticulum in place, an organelle, to hold the mitochondria into place, which is another organelle. All right, let's talk about each of those real quick. So the microfilaments, they start with something called a G-actin, and it forms this long chain. Well, when you put these long chains together, they twist. So just like if you took a pearl necklace, you held the tip here, held the tip here, and gave it a twist, it kind of twists over each other. The problem is if you give it a hard tug, what happens to those pearls? Well, they fall all over the place, right? It's not very strong. So if you took an electron microscope and you looked up really close, you can kind of see here you have those little um, pearls that kind of twist around. Here's another strand that kind of twists up and around, and they just keep twisting over each other. They're very, very thin. When you look at the cell, if we were to stain this with a fluorescent um, marker and looked at it, you can see the microfilaments usually go around the outside edge and then up into these structures called microvilli, which we really haven't talked about yet. So some of the primary purposes is to make something called actin. And actin is this protein component. When we talk about muscles, we'll talk about actin and myosin and how they help with muscle contraction. So when you hear the word actin, you want to think microfilaments, small, thin filaments. Other functions, they help with muscle contraction, amoeboid-like movements. When I was talking about how it kind of projects a foot out, grabs and pulls, projects a foot out, grabs and pulls, that's amoeboid-like. Um, the, some of the structures, microvilli, this is an example of a microvilli. It's just a little projection that comes out of the cell. The whole purpose of microvilli is to extend the surface area so that I can do more things like absorb, right? And then hair cells are not hair. They're a special type of cell that's in your ear that detects vibrations, and we'll talk about those. But the microvilli that are projecting out are just like these little hair cells that have projections that detect vibration and motion. Here's just another example uh, from a textbook. You can see it twists around each other again. When you look, this is an electron microscope, a TEM, transmission electron microscope picture. Here's a cell membrane. You can see how the membrane comes up and around the microvilli, up and around the microvilli. In fact, remember this is three-dimensional. There you can see kind of a microvilli off in the distance. So if you're looking from the top, you'd see lots and lots of microvilli like this from the top. But we're slicing across the side. Look at all these thin fibers that are going up and down. These are all microfilaments. So again, up here, when you're looking up and down, you can see these microfilaments that are coming up and filling this up. And then they come down and they start spreading out. They're more for attachments. They're like string-like attachments. And you usually see microfilaments just below the surface of the cell, so just below the plasma membrane. Next are the intermediate filaments. They're just a little bit bigger. So if you look at these, they're not chains of pearls. They're actually long fibrous units that are twisted together. And then you tie a lot of these together. So in reality, you have a couple that pair up, a couple more pair up, a couple more pair up, and then you have this long chain. But they're kind of able to twist a little bit. So they're more like a rope where they can twist and bend. If you're looking at an electron microscope uh, um, picture, you can see these filaments kind of crisscross in their arrangement. They're kind of 
well, I don't want to say firm, but they're stronger. They're like a rope. Right? And here's another example. You can see how they kind of overlap. So I always think of them as being kind of hinge-like. If I want to bend, this one and this one will separate slightly so that it bends. These can separate slightly to bend that way. So they give you a little bit of a bend. And here's a fluorescent microscopy picture, and you can see how this is like webbing all over the cell. If you look at a similar picture for um, actin or microfilaments, you'd see them around the outside. And this one you see webbing all over the place. Right. Another common place you find intermediate filaments are in myosin, like we've already talked about. Myosin we're going to see a lot in muscle, but also keratin. Keratin's all over the place. Keratin is in your skin. It gives you strength to the skin. It helps waterproof the skin. It's in your nails, your toenails and your fingernails. It makes them hard. We call that hard keratin. It's all over the place. It gives your hair strength. So some of these places you're going to see coming back up over and over again, like when we talk about the skin or when we talk about muscles. So I'm trying to preview right now so we're ready for the, the heavier material as we go down the road. Next are the microtubules. And again, they have a tube shape. And look at the proteins. They form this long spiraling chain that forms a tube. It's kind of cool how they come together and break apart. But you can see them all flying together like little magnets until they form the cylinder. And then when they break apart, they just peel apart and fall back apart. Your cytoskeleton, your cell skeleton, can keep rearranging like this. It comes together on one end, falls apart on another. In fact, if you ever get a chance, um, Google, and put this in quotes, quote, inner life of the cell, unquote. And it'll pull up some animations that were made by Harvard a while back, and it shows all the structures we're talking about in these videos animated. So it'll show you the microtubules, and we'll get a chance to see how they come together, and then they peel apart when they're ready to rearrange. So if this thing wants to um, reach out, if this whole cell wants to reach out, it can rearrange these microtubules and project outward. It's really cool how it does it. It's almost like if you needed a third arm, you could just grow a third arm, and then when you're done with it, you just bring it back in. That's how the cell works, and it's pretty amazing. When you look at the microtubules uh, under a, a transmission electron microscope again, here you can see how long and straight and firm they are. When you look, you have these long structures that are branching out, almost like a spider to me. But there aren't as many of them as you saw with microfilaments and intermediate filaments. There are a lot fewer of them, but they give a lot of structure and a lot of strength. And the same thing here. You can see the nucleus, you can see all the microtubules branching out all over the place. The resolution between these is a lot better because they're larger structures, so you can see things more clearly. Some of the places you're going to find these, one's going to be something called a mitotic spindle. Right? So mitotic spindles, when we go through cell division, we go through something called mitosis. The mitotic spindle is down here at a pole. So if you imagine this a cell around here, a whole cell, and at one end of the cell you have a north pole, the other end you have a south pole, this whole area through here is called the mitotic spindle or the mitotic center. So here's um, an electron microscope image. Here you can see the pole. Here you can see the pole. Here you can see these green microtubules that branch out of the pole and they go to the equator. Here you can see the equivalent going to the equator. Along the equator are chromosomes. And what these things do is that the centrioles in the mitotic spindle will pull on the microtubules and they'll rip the chromosomes apart to help separate the cell from one cell to make two cells. And that's how a cell replicates. Other times where you see massive movement, like cilia or flagella, and I have a slide that goes through these a lot better, but you can see this is kind of like the microvilli where it's projection coming out. But in this situation, you have these long microtubules that are very firm. Now I said movement, and I also talked about microfilaments being very firm. The way you have to imagine this is when you look proportionally at the cell, this cilia that's coming out as flagella is like, um, comparatively, it's like the size of the Empire State Building coming out of the middle of New York. It's this huge thing that towers over New York. Well, think about the Empire State Building. It's built with long steel I-beams, these long steel beams. So they shouldn't be very flexible. But in reality, if you go to the top of the Empire State Building up here, and you're standing on a windy day, this thing can sway 10 feet this direction. It could come back and sway another 10 feet that direction. That's how these cilia move. So they have long firm microtubules, but as you shift the microtubules around, they kind of bend a little to the side, bend a little back to the other side, back and forth. And if you're looking down this, you can see how they're arranged around the outside, all these microtubules, and then you have a pair right in the center. So what happens are these on the outside revolve around the center ones. If they want to bend over to the left, then they'll just bend this way. So these microtubules will pull the center this way. If you want to bend to the right, the ones on the right bend this way. 
Right? So they bend back and forth. So if we sliced across the top of a bunch of cilia, here you can see all these cilia. You can see down in, you can see all those arrangements of microtubules. There's the plasma membrane around the outside edge, and then there's the microtubules all set inside of it. And then there's another cilia, and another cilia, and another cilia, and another cilia, all over the place. All right. So I want to talk just a little bit more about this mitotic spindle because we're going to talk about mitosis. And mitosis is really important for cell division. Without it, you wouldn't be able to replicate. You wouldn't be able to turn it from a stem cell into anything. You'd stay a stem cell your entire life. If you didn't have mitosis and you got a cut on your skin, you'd never be able to replicate cells to fill in that cut. So here's some special terms that you need to get familiar with. The centrosomes and the centrioles. So the centrosomes oops, excuse me, are right in the middle of the chromosomes. So here you have a little centrosome. It's, it's basically like a little bow tie knot in the middle holding this chromosome together with a microtubule. The centrioles are up here. Centrioles sit at the poles, and the centrioles are like puppet masters. When they want to split the chromosomes, they just pull on the chromosomes so hard that this one's pulling towards the south pole, and this one's attached here pulling towards the north pole. They pull so hard that they rip the chromosome right down the middle. And when we talk about mitosis, we'll go into that in better detail. So these structures are really interesting. So here you have early mitotic structures. They start changing. They start moving around, and basically they, they start getting active for ripping and dividing the cell. So centrosome, remember, is in the middle of the chromosome, where centriole is this paired little body up here in the mitotic spindle. Right? I told you earlier, microtubules form a molecular railroad. So here's the picture I've been showing you. You've got a mitochondria, you've got the endoplasmic reticulum, you've got all these railway systems, these microtubules. Well, when you want to transport something, like let's say in this situation we have a little tiny vesicle. It's a membrane-bound organelle. It's a little pocket, basically, or trunk. If I want to move that around the cell, I just stick it on this little structure. It's called dienin, and this little dienin guy will walk it down the microtubules. And it's funny watching it. So if you watch that inner life of the cell video, this foot here will cross over and then plant itself. And then this foot will cross over and plant itself. So they actually look like little guys walking along the tube. They can carry organelles. So if they want to move the mitochondria, they hold on to it and they just carry it down. They can move vesicles, these things. They can move anything back and forth. In fact, these little guys can grab a hold of, well, chromosome parts, and they can pull, they can contribute to ripping the cell in half. If they want to move cilia or flagella, you can see the little guys here. There's another one, there's another one, there's another one. Here's your microtubule. So one half of it will grab the cell membrane, the other half will stand on the microtubule, and then if it wants to bend, it will start walking towards the end, and it will bend the cilia. If it wants to go the other way, this other guy grabs a hold and starts walking away, and it bends the cilia. It's really a cool process when you see how these things work. But it's amazing. It's, it's based on this microtubule railroad. You can move organelles, you can move chromosomes, you can move cilia, you can move flagella. There's a lot of movement inside the cell. We used to think it was just this floating bleb or glob of fluid and jelly-like substance, but now we know it's extremely well organized. These microtubules give it structure, strength, mobility, help it to move around in space. It gives it a lot of, uh, of structure. Right? And then I've kind of already discussed this, but I put another slide in here that's a little bit more detailed so that you can look down a flagella and you can see all of those arrangements. So you have nine pairs of microtubules revolving around one central pair. Right? So here on the outside, they pull on this side differently than they pull on the other side so that it'll wiggle back and forth or propel. A cilia, the way it moves, is kind of cool too. Cilia you have in your airway. So if you breathe in dust or pollen or um, particles from the air or if you breathe in tobacco smoke, these little cilia, they're not very long, they're kind of short, but they sit right at the surface of your airway so that if you get something on here, they'll actually grab a hold of it and move it. So the cilia doesn't actually move the whole cell, typically. It moves things across the surface of the cell because the cilia is not very long. Here's just another example. So let's say the cilia wants to move something that way. It grabs a hold of it here and moves it like crowd surfs it, like Eddie Vedder you know, from Pearl Jam. He jumps on the crowd and he surfs across the crowd because all their hands are going the same direction. Well, once these hands get to their extent over here, they come back down, pull under, grab, and then move something else along. Pull back down, go under, grab, and then pull something else along. And they can propel things. That's why when you don't smoke, if you inhale dust particles and allergens and things like that, it'll bring those particles up your throat, put it in your nose, and then you can just pick it out later. Kidding, but seriously, actually you can. 
And then the way flagella work are a little bit different. Flagella, you can see the same kind of arrangement that you see with the cilia, but the way it moves is slightly different. This is more of a propeller motion. So it's almost like a boat propeller or, or whatever they call that thing on the back of the boat, I guess. So it, it kind of gives a rotational motion and it propels the sperm through space. So I put this slide in here for a comparison again. Here you can see those epithelial cells in your throat. If you zoom in and look at one, you can see the little cilia coming up off of it. They're not huge, but if there's a mucus layer across the top like in this, you see the mucus, the cilia can reach under the mucus, grab it, and push it forward. It reaches back down under, grabs it, and pushes it forward. So it's constantly moving the particles in the mucus up toward your nose so you can get rid of it, or to your throat so you can swallow it. And then here you can see there's the body of a sperm. Look at that long tail that comes all the way up and over. That's pretty long. When you're looking at cilia, cilia are really short, they're very brief. So this is just a, a way to compare and look at the different types. Right. Here's a review slide so you can go back and look through. You can compare microtubules to filaments and intermediate filaments based on what they look like, based on their size or thickness, um, what kind of proteins they use as their subunits, and even their main functions. Here you can see a fluorescent microscopy picture. Uh, you can see the different structures in here when you're looking at microtubules versus microfilaments and versus intermediate filaments. So you can get to compare the different ones. Oh, and here's how they arrange too. Uh, this is kind of a cool picture. So in here, the actin filaments are like a light purple, and you can see that the actin is kind of hard sometimes to distinguish. There's so many of them all over the place. When you look at the microtubules, though, you can look at the very clear strands. They're very thick. And then, of course, here's the, the nucleus. Uh, so this is a fluorescent microscopy picture. Over here, you have a trans, uh, transmission electron mic micrograph picture of the inside of a cell. Here you see all these actin, the strings that are tied all over the place. They give structure to the inner surface. It's almost like a net that holds everything together. So here's a picture of the plasma membrane. You can see those yellow nets going all over the place. And so I wish I could color these into a yellow net. And later we're going to talk about transport, or maybe you've already seen the video on transport, but here's some clathrin coated pits. Clathrin coated pit, clathrin coated pit. So you can actually see these trap things, they bring it in and then they're shuttled around by these microfilaments on the inside. It's a very cool picture. Next are cytoplasmic inclusions. And depending on who you talk to, they're technically not organelles. They're not alive. They're temporary structures. They're not alive. So the cell. Um, they hold them kind of like little storage trunks. So you see things like glycosomes. When you see zome in a word, it's talking about a body. So this is a sugary body. And the sugar that you want to think of usually is going to be glucose. So these are little packages of glucose. You find them primarily in things like muscle and liver cells as storage units. Uh, over in this example, here you can see this is a muscle. You can see all these little granules of glucose stuck in here. And then after exercising the muscle, what they do is they contract it under the microscope a bunch of times, and then you look at it again, and most of those little granules are gone. You can see some little packets of granules, but nowhere near as much of this. Why do you think that is? Well, it's because with exercise, you burned up those sugars. So these are temporary storage units, and they're called inclusions. They're just included in the cytosol. They're not a technical organelle. Another one is a lipid. So lipids, when you eat them, we eat triglycerides like in our cheeseburger. We absorb it, break it apart, and then when we store it in our love handles and our butt cheeks, we store it again as triglycerides. So when you're looking at adipose cells that are storing it, you can see these little fatty inclusions. When you're looking specifically at an adipose cell, you're going to see a huge fatty inclusion because that's their whole purpose is to store fat. But when you're looking at like uh, a liver tissue or a brain tissue, then you're going to see these little tiny droplets inside of there. Like For instance, if you have a night out drinking, that alcohol goes to your liver and it makes it hard for you to get rid of fat. It makes it hard for you to process fat. So the next day you might have some of these fatty inclusions in your liver cells. If you're an alcoholic, these fatty inclusions just keep accumulating and accumulating and it causes something called a fatty liver, which can eventually become a sclerotic liver. All right, so triglycerides. Some of these things are crystalline and crystallines are made out of proteins. These can be good and they can be bad, just like any of these. Too much of any of these can be a bad thing. Too little of any of these can be a bad thing. So the crystalline products are typically made of proteins. And when we're looking at this, this is actually a neuron. So here you have the neural body, there's the nucleus right there. Here you have, what's this long cylindrical thing coming out of it? Well, that's the axon, right? So here you have the axons that are coming out and you can see along the edge of the axons and the cell body these little inclusions. 
these inclusions can be good. Sometimes they're like little storage for amino acids or proteins, but sometimes it can be bad. Look at this one. So here you have one neuron, there's a cell body, and here you have this big inclusion. It's almost like a tumor growing inside the, the cell. It acts like it too. So if you have a brain tumor, it starts smashing your brain and turning off parts of your brain. This cell quote unquote tumor, this protein thing we call a Lewy body, as it accumulates, it actually starts starving and killing that neuron, which can cause things like Alzheimer's disease. So too much of these proteins can actually be a bad thing. And then the last are pigments, and pigments are just dyes. So you'll see pigments in red blood cells, it's called hemoglobin, you see it in your skin cells, called melanin. Um, you see it all over the place. You can see little iron pigments uh, in different cells. And it's called ferrin or ferritin. But you have all these different kind of pigments. In this situation, you actually have something called lipofusin. And the lipofusin is, is kind of a yellowy in color. It can be bad if it accumulates too much. In fact, if you get too much sun, your skin will start accumulating lipofusin right under the surface and it gives you something called liver spots. Those don't go away. So once it accumulates too much, it's hard to get rid of these substances. Here's just another example I put in here. So here's actually a hepatocyte, which means a liver cell. And there's a large liver droplet, or lip, liver, lipid droplet. And you can see what it's doing to the nucleus. It's smashing the nucleus back here. So having too many of these lipid droplets, like this is starting to accumulate a bunch of them, or one big one, can actually do damage to the cell. It can smash and kill the cell. That's why things like fatty liver is bad for you. And here's actually an example of disease states. So here's a normal cell. You can see all the organelles we're going to talk about, nucleus. And then as you start accumulating these lipid droplets and you can't get rid of it, they keep accumulating and accumulating. So with like alcoholism, they just keep accumulating in the liver and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until, look what they do to the mitochondria. This is what makes energy for your cell. So if you kill the mitochondria, you smash it, what happens to your ability to make energy? You can't make it very efficiently, right? And then look at the nucleus. It's starting to get smashed in the corner. Here's your endoplasmic reticulum, smashed down on the side. You're killing the cell. Once the cell is dead, there's no coming back from dead. So all of these things, they're important, but having the wrong or improper amount can be dangerous. Even the cytoskeleton, if you can't rearrange it and it makes the cell firm and immobile, it can actually kill the cell. Right? The last of the inclusions or I shouldn't say inclusions, the last of the non-membrane bound organelles are the ribosomes. And we're going to talk about these again when we talk about the membrane bound organelles. But ribosomes technically don't have a membrane around them. You have ribosomes that are a mix of two things, protein and ribosomal RNA, or it's referred to as rRNA. The ribosome is kind of like a mixer in your kitchen. So I, I love these things. This is like the top of the mixer and here's the bowl. They don't really work if you don't have both. The bowl is kind of worthless and the mixer head is kind of worthless until you put them together and now they work. So ribosomes, what they're doing is they're mixing up some proteins. So ribosomes, they're made of proteins, but they also make proteins. It's like making a tool to make other tools. It's a necessary thing you have to do. So it mixes with proteins and rRNA, which is ribosomal RNA, and they make this ribosome. The key you want to remember is that ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. You have to have these ribosomes to make proteins. Right? The process of making a protein is called translation. It's almost like I give you a recipe, you translate the recipe into an actual product. And when we talk about genetics later, we'll actually get into this. Right? So I'm not going to talk too much about ribosomes now because when we come back and talk about the membrane bound organelles, I'm going to talk about ribosomes again. Ribosomes can be free, free floating. Uh, non-membrane organelles out here, or they can be attached to a membrane-bound organelle like the endoplasmic reticulum and work there too. I don't really have a review review slide for this section, so I'm just going to leave it there and we'll come back on the next video.